So welcome everyone to this fifth celebration in connection with the Praxis Award in Professional Ethics. My name is Mark Dorley. I am the uh, director of the ethics program and the MC for this evening. So the ethics program in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences inaugurated this annual event in the spring of 2007. Our goal was simple to recognize and celebrate an individual for his or her outstanding commitment to the ethical ideals of his or her profession. We have been fortunate to have amazing people come to spend time with us and to receive this award. With Dr. Milton Donaldson, MD, God continues to bless our award with an extraordinary human being and physician. I am very grateful that you are all here to help us to celebrate Mickey Donaldson and to support the vision of the Praxis Award. It is always incumbent upon the MC or the host to thank the people that have made this possible, so I want to do that uh, before we get too much farther. It's uh, impossible to do something like this without financial support and sponsorship, and that has come from all of the undergraduate colleges at this university, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the College of Nursing, the College of Engineering, and the Villanova School of Business. So to the deans of those colleges, Dean Duty, Dean Fitzpatrick, will be here a bit later, uh, Dean Gabriel and Dean Danko, my deepest appreciations for your generosity and support. And finally, and probably most importantly for me, I want everyone to give a round of applause for Mrs. Mary Quilter, my administrative assistant, who is most responsible for today. So at this point, I'd like to ask Dean Duty from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences to come forward and has a few words for us. Thank you, Mark, and on behalf of Villanova again, welcome to everyone here, especially our guests and our visitors today. I'll be brief, but I do want to say a few words about the significance of this award. The word praxis has a wonderful heritage going back to Aristotle and Greek philosophy, and it's always meant, meant to play off of the concept of theory or theoria and to look at the ways in which we first theorize about human behavior and then how we actually put it into practice. Oh, about 30, 40 years ago, a distinguished Harvard uh, philosopher ethicist, John Rawls, wrote a book that many people thought was going to be the book in the, about ethics in the 20th century. A theory of justice. And in that book, Rawls argues with an initial conception that the best way to think about ethics, morality, justice is for us to become a disencumbered self, i.e. not to know who we are, to be a self that doesn't have a sense of its purpose and identity. Rawls arguing that if we can become disembodied selves, we wouldn't know what our self-interest was, so we went in a room, we wouldn't know what to negotiate for because we would be able to figure out whether or not we were negotiating on the part of a plumber or a president of a corporation. About 10 years later, the eminent philosopher Alistair McIntyre wrote the perfect counterbalance uh, to uh, Rawls's argument and argued exactly the opposite. And, they, and that is that in order for us to talk about the good life, we have to understand the social roles that we play, the identities that we are embodied, and for him, McIntyre, the key concept that explains how we come to know ourselves is by looking at our practices, our praxis. Now, doctors have a practice, lawyers have a practice, uh, philosophers have a practice, uh, and so do myriad other folks, from Memo Lagasse to uh, President Obama. A practice is a well-defined social activity that is cooperative in nature and aims to uh, fulfill its telos. McIntyre argues that the way in which we ought to practice is to understand the difference between internal and external goods. External goods like money, fame, and fortune are things that are uh, in competition, and, and for one person to have it, the other person can't have it. In other words, they are not communal, they're not shared goods, they're private goods. Internal goods, on the other hand, are those goods by virtue of which people in a practice engage in a practice, fulfilling the excellent standards of those practices create the common good for everyone involved, and therefore internal goods can be shared as opposed to be objects of competition. Well, what Villanova University is doing in this award is to honoring people who have lived up to the highest standards of excellence in their practice. And by doing so, we, they have contributed to the common good, which in fact is exactly what the Augustinian Catholic vision of, of um, the moral life, our social life, and our political responsibilities are. 
My hat's off to my favorite philosopher, Alistair McIntyre, for having given us the language so that we can understand, appreciate, and tell the story of why an award like this is so fitting for us at Villanova to be sharing with the people that we're honoring. I welcome you again on Villanova and have a good, uh, good evening. Now, lest you think I forgot he was here, um, I need to thank Father President, Father Peter, for coming today. I told him he has a night off. He can just enjoy and, and mingle with people. So please, if, you don't, if you've never met Father Peter, make it a point to introduce yourself um, tonight. So thank you, Dr. Duty, for that. I wasn't expecting the, the Rawls to McIntyre, but that's good. It's great. Right on target. Before we get to the presentation of the award, I'd like to explain briefly the selection process. Each spring, we seek nominations for the following year's award. In fact, uh, on the tables in the back is the call for nominations for next year. Not that we want to move on too quickly from Dr. Donaldson, but, but this is a good opportunity. Um, so feel free to, to take a copy. Those nominations are then, then vetted by a committee made up of representatives from each of the undergraduate professional colleges, the law school, as well as four members of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. I'd like to introduce those members uh, and ask them if they could please stand so everybody could see who they are. So first is Professor Wilmot, the Associate Director of the Ethics Program. Professor Barbara Ott of the College of Nursing. Uh, Frank, Professor Frank Falcone of the College of Engineering. Professor Brian Oda of the Department of Chemistry. Professor uh, Doris Brogan of the Law School, Professor Karen Hollis of the Department of English, and Professor Nicholas Rangione of the Villanova School of Business. They have class tonight, so I don't know how I ended up picking a day when they'd have class, but anyway. Um, I serve as the chair of that selection committee, and last April we met and went through our uh, nominations, and the result is this year's recipient. So without further ado, Professor Falcone, who, ha who nominated Dr. Donaldson, I've asked him to introduce this year's recipient. Father Peter, deans of the colleges, and Dr. Dorley, thanks so much for this opportunity to introduce you all to uh, an exceptional individual, Dr. Donaldson. <clears throat> as many of you know, Dr. Donaldson, known to many of us affectionately as Dr. D, is unable to be with us here for this very special award this evening because of his pers personal health situation. He's in North Carolina relaxing, but we all know in our hearts that he's with us mentally and spiritually, if not physically. In honor of Dr. Donaldson and in recognition of his selection to receive the fourth annual Praxis Award in Professional Ethics here at Villanova. Please allow me to introduce uh, some of his colleagues who are here with us this evening. And please hold your applause until uh, all names and titles are announced. Uh, Dr. Susan Travis, she's with Co she was retired now, Cooper, Med Cooper Pediatric Hematology and Oncology Physician and a longtime associate of Dr. Donaldson's. Uh, Peggy Birdsall and Scarlett O'Hara, yes, it is Scarlett O'Hara, <laughs> lab technicians with Dr. Donaldson's Division of Pediatric Hematology and Oncology at Cooper. Uh, Pat Heady, Secretary at Cooper and Dr. Donaldson's Hemoc Division. Dr. Barry Barnowski, PhD research scientist in cytoimmunology in Dr. D's Pediatric Hematology and Oncology Division. Linda Bloomstein, lab research technician with Dr. Barnowski, also in Dr. D's pediatric hematology and oncology division. Shirley Langraf, who was Dr. D's secretary. Teddy Thomas, who was the, who was the business manager for the Cooper Hemont division with Dr. D, and she's also the executive director for the Ronald McDonald House in Camden. And then John and Joan Canuso. John is a Southern New Jersey builder and a civil engineering graduate of uh, Villanova University, class of 63, who built the very first Ronald McDonald House in Philadelphia and has been involved ever since. 
Let's all give them a strong round of applause and a welcome to Villanova. <clears throat> it was most certainly my pleasure to recommend Dr. Donaldson for the prestigious practice award in professional ethics here at Villanova. And I wish to thank the selection committee for honoring him and recognizing his accomplishments by selecting him. <coughs> offer some comments here. I would like us all, just for a minute, and perhaps this applies to the older individuals in the room, moreover than the students or our younger colleagues, to think back to when we chose our career paths. Why did we all choose the career paths that we followed? Suppose for a minute that in the career selection process of your youth, we knew that along the path that we were about to embark upon, there was, no, <clears throat> there was nothing but failure ahead. That based on the history of our selected career path, no matter what we did, no matter how hard we worked, and no matter how much we gave of ourselves to our chosen profession, the chances of us actually realizing some success in our lifetime as measured by positive results were essentially equal to zero. Suppose just for a minute that that was what we faced along our chosen career paths. <coughs> Climbing a mountain with unacceptable equipment and attempting to reach the summit following a path cluttered with disaster that no one had ever reached before and that no one was ever expected to reach. Under such daunting and overwhelming circumstances in our youth, I wonder how many of us would have charged forward along that path, fraught with seemingly endless failure. Or would we have turned back and chosen an easier and perhaps more well-worn path to follow? <clears throat> when Mickey Donaldson chose the field of pediatric hematology and oncology, that was, in fact, the situation. When he chose that career path, children diagnosed with these types of blood disorders were essentially receiving death sentences. Through Dr. D's relentless lifelong work in pediatric hematology and oncology, through his refusal to accept continual failure, and through similar efforts by his colleagues at Cooper and around the world, thankfully, failure is no longer the only outcome. Real, substantial, and measurable advances have been made in the field of pediatric hematology and oncology over the past few decades. A true pioneer in his chosen field of medicine, Dr. D also has a full and compassionate understanding of the emotional needs of families dealing with the unexplainable and unimaginable, fu future, unimaginable future that follows such a devastating diagnosis of a child. Because of this understanding, he was instrumental in the development of the Ronald McDonald House in Philadelphia and later on in Camden. As we all know, there are now Ronald McDonald Houses around the world helping innumerable such families who are truly indeed. And Teddy told me just a few minutes ago that there are 303 Ronald McDonald houses throughout the world now in 32 countries. Mickey was instrumental in starting that worldwide program. <clears throat> Dr. D's medical and humanitarian accomplish, accomplishments are considerable and in the long term almost immeasurable. In addition, his personal humility his service to our nation in the U.S. Marine Corps, where he earned a Purple Heart, and his genuous, genuine, deep, and giving nature as a human being is truly singular. For all of these re reasons briefly stated here, it's been my distinct pleasure to recommend Dr. Donaldson for this year's Praxis Award in Professional Ethics. And once again, I thank the Selection Committee for helping us all learn more about this outstanding contributor to goodness in the world. Thank you all. Thank you, Frank. So I'd ask uh, Dr. Travis and Mr. Canuso if you please come forward up and join me up here on the 
this. So these two people will represent Dr. Donaldson. So it is my distinct pleasure for all the reasons and more that uh, we've just heard from Professor Falcone to present Dr. Milton M. Donaldson, MD, with the 2011 Praxis Award in Professional Ethics. Not only does Dr. Donaldson receive an honorarium to mark this occasion, but he will receive this lovely memento from here at Villanova, which reads, the Praxis Award in Professional Ethics, Milton H. Donaldson, MD, in recognition of his commitment to professional integrity, presented this the 31st day of March, 2011, the Ethics Program, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, Villanova University. Okay, Dr. Travis and Mr. Canusa have a few words for us. Uh, tonight's uh, Praxis Award does not address Dr. Donaldson's many academic and professional achievements, but serves as recognition of his commitment to the welfare of his patients and their families, and the establishment of programs that went well beyond the previously accepted standard of care for children with malignant disorders. I started to work with Dr. Donaldson when I joined the Division of Pediatric Hematology Oncology at Cooper Hospital University Medical Center in Camden in 1985. I was previously aware that he was a well-known and respected pediatric oncologist from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, who was hired by Dr. Sidney Sussman in 1980 to develop a pediatric hematology oncology program at Cooper. I soon learned that Dr. Donaldson's program was much more than following chemotherapy protocols. He had established a program of ex excellence that included community outreach. He worked tirelessly to establish the first Ronald McDonald House in the state of New Jersey, which opened its doors in Camden in 1983. He was committed to the concept of comprehensive care, which included not only medically treating children with cancer, but attending to their psychological needs um, and those of their families as well. The program included a dedicated oncology social worker who proactively met with families from the day of diagnosis, not just in crisis situations, and helped patients and families endure chemotherapy, painful procedures, acceptance of the diagnosis, and coping with the fears and apprehensions surrounding a potentially life-threatening disease. The ongoing sibling problems and marital stress created by the diagnosis and treatment were also addressed. We tried to prevent problems, not treat them after they occurred. When appropriate, school visits were performed to prepare classmates and teachers for the child's re-entry into the classroom setting. Funding was obtained to employ a full-time psychologist to enhance the school re-entry program and perform psychometric testing on the patients prior to treatment, whenever feasible, so pre-existing learning problems could be separated from the side effects of chemotherapy. These programs are fairly common or more commonplace now but in those days, they were very, very innovative. Um, all of these programs required extramural funding. Dr. Donaldson was a dedicated and tireless fundraiser, and in 1986 was successful in having Cooper designated as a Valerie Fund Children's Center for the treatment of children with cancer and blood disorders. These unrestricted funds we used to help sustain the psychosocial support programs, uh, <clears throat> and along with funding from other sources, the laboratory capabilities were enhanced. Flow cytometry and cytogenetics laboratories were established within the division of hematology, of pediatric hematology, oncology, to enhance diagnostic capabilities and promote research programs. 
The hematology program also expanded and received recognition with the establishment of New Jersey state-funded comprehensive hemophilia and sickle cell centers. The same holistic approach to treating hematology patients was now facilitated when these funds permitted the hiring of an additional social worker who guided families through education about the manifestations and treatment of these disorders and teaching coping mechanisms to help deal with their children's inherited, lifelong, and often debilitating illnesses. Dr. Donaldson has received numerous other awards, including the Eagles Fly for Leukemia Lifetime Achievement <clears throat> Award, and was selected by his alma mater to receive the Tulane Medical Alumni Association's C.D. Taylor President's Award for service to mankind in the community. He is truly deserving of the Praxis Award in professional ethics. On a very personal level, but further illustrative of Mickey's comp compassion. When I mentioned preparing tonight's speech to my son, <clears throat> he said, Mom, I do not know about Dr. Donaldson's professional achievements, excuse me, but I do remember that when Dad died suddenly, a year after you came to Cooper, you called him and he came right over to the house and was very kind. My son was 10 years old at the time. Well, crying is very, is very supportive of Nikki because he cried during every speech, so why should I be any different? But <laughs> I, I am obviously one of his protégés. <laughs> but he, he was 10 years old at the time. He is now 35 years old and still remembers Mickey's kindness and comforting manner that evening. That compassion and ability to touch and comfort those who were grief-stricken are what make him a wonderful physician and human being. Thank you. Father Peter. Deans, professors, friends, my wife, Jen. Um, I come to you as uh, one of his patients. I, I say I come to you as his patient. I come to you because we were all his patients. And Susan was right. He, he's a crier. He makes us criers, right? Uh, first of all, this is special for me, right? I'm a Villanova grad. I bleed blue and white. <laughs> Father Peter will tell you that. We have the, I, I was married here at, at the chapel in 1961. We're gonna have our 50th wedding anniversary this year. And I hope, I hope we're back here at the chapel on our 50th. We baptized our kids here and we have the largest family of graduates and alumni. Over 57 of our family are graduated here from Villanova. So to be here with you to talk about my friend, my dearest friend. And when you talk about the highest standard, he went higher, right? And it's, it's not many guys that you run into in your life that you can say went beyond the highest standard. Uh, my story starts 37 years ago on a Friday afternoon, I think it was August, uh, April 4th, uh, 1974. And I'm in my office at my desk and I get a phone call from my pediatrician and says, John, you're needed at a children's hospital. Your daughter has leukemia. I thought that was pretty harsh for my pediatrician to say those words to me when I am an hour away from children's hospital. And I find myself, how am I going to get to this place? I, now, Mickey wasn't uh, my pediatrician, but he just happened to be the first guy I met when I got to children's hospital. But the hour drive from my workplace to children's hospital was, what is leukemia? Is my daughter gonna die? Because that's all it mattered to me. And I have seven children, and Babe was my third, right? And I knew that I had a nephew that died of leukemia, but I never knew what the word meant. And to be honest with you, I never cared what the word meant. I cared about my kid. So, when I got to the hospital, 
we were ushered into Mickey's office. And here's this southern guy, this southern accent, right? And we sit in front of him, and he's crying, right? And he always cries. And imagine, I'm just, you know, I'm just another one of his patients. And can you imagine that this man sits there as the human side? So I know him as Mickey, right? To me, he's Mickey. To the doctors, he's Dr. D or to whatever, but to me, he was Mickey. And Mickey helped us really helped us balance our lives to understand that there was hope. No guarantees, but there was hope. And one thing Mickey gave us was that hope. And he gave all those families that came. We were a regional hospital. Now imagine, in 1974, Children's Hospital was on Bainbridge Street. It wasn't where it is now, right? It was in a tough neighborhood, right? And people came from all over the East Coast to calm the Children's Hospital, right? And he, he helped us tremendously. So there's, a, there's that physical side, that doctor side, and that's our human side, right? And we needed that hope to survive. So I said to him, Doc, what can I do? What can I do for you? He said, John, go home and take care of your family. Because when something like this affects a family, and truly affects the family, you know, that big C word, cancer, affects a family. It's not only the C word, but it's a C word that deals with your kids. So what is the worst news that you can hear on any given day? And you have a guy like Mickey that helps you and gives you hope. So he says, go home and be close to your family because a lot of families break up. So either your family becomes closer or they separate, right? And although we were very close as a family, right? We we're very religious. We went to our faith, right? Uh, we went very close to our faith. And we prayed to all the, all the patron saints of hope, right? Whether it was uh, St. Jude or St. Rita or Padre Pia, all these patron saints, right, we prayed to. But we really, uh, we really needed the strength that a guy like Mickey gave us, the hope that Babe would survive this thing. So, um, two weeks after I first met with him, and I went home and we talked about a lot of things, I get a call back in my office from Mickey. He said, John, can you come into my office? And I said, sure, Doc, I'd be glad to. Now keep in mind, in the last week or so before he called me, Joni and I are at Bainbridge Hospital while our daughter's being treated, we're in the hallways of that hospital. And there's cots up and down this hallways, right? And there's people from Rhode Island, Connecticut, North Jersey, whatever, and they're sleeping in these cots. And we're talking to each other. And one thing led to another, and we were finding that we were building strength with each other, right? That we needed each other. You know, your mom and dad can help you a little bit, your priest can help you a little bit, but the bottom line is, you wanna be in the same boat with people that are experiences the same thing that you are, so you share those experiences. So he says to me on that phone call when I go up and see him, he says, John, he says, you're a home builder. I said, yes. He says, we need a house. And I looked at him and I said, I know you do. Now, I only knew he did only because I experienced those hallways and these people that were living in these hallways that really needed to go to a place, right, where they could break bed, right, clean up and share experiences, right? And from that, within six months, between Jim Murray, Eagles Fly, uh, the uh, Green Milkshake Program at uh, St. Patty's Day, right? Plus building this house and understanding, A, as a family man, what a home should be, right? Six kids in a home, right? As a home builder, building homes for people and understanding well, what was really neat came to first Ronald McDonald House, right? And it was special. And Mickey was excited and we created that first McDonald House from that phone call. Um, after that, when he moved to Camden, I looked at him and I met him down in Camden at Cooper Hospital and I said, I guess we're building another house, aren't we? He said, yeah, we need it in Camden. And we built, we got the home builders and we built them another house. But, I just want to be brief just to say to you that this is a special man. He's done a lot for my family. And you know, when we went through 
this trial of leukemia. They went on a five-year cycle. Five years, she, she took that medicine that would kill any of us, right? And it depressed her. At the end of five years, they said to us, you can take her off, you can leave her, leave her on it. And I would say to Mickey, Mick, what do I do? He says, John, we don't know enough to tell you whether to keep her on for five years or take her off. And they had this computer in LA or something and they data bank and they looked at all these statistics and nobody could tell you what the right decision was. And Joni and I made a decision that our daughter was, uh, you know, fighting life, overweight. You know, she just wanted to be another kid, you know, just like her friends in school. And th that medicine was really depressing her. So we made a decision since nobody would tell us, we took her off the medication. And from that day on, as far as I was concerned, she was cured. And Mickey helped us every step of the way. And all they wanted to do was to live a normal life. So she got married. Right, 22, 23. She had a baby called Michael. And guess who the godfather was? Mickey, right? Because kids that went through the chemo and the radiation didn't, didn't reproduce or didn't have a history of it. You know? I mean, the baby was a rare kid. And she had three kids, and Mickey was the godfather of the first kid. That was a special, that was just special. So later in life, she, she had brain tumors and she passed. And the last time, you know, when babe, babe was in her, uh, when we had mass for her, Father Dobbin came and surprised me. And he came and said mass in Jersey. And it was just special. Had all these Villanova priests that came to South Jersey to give ma Babe's mass. And Mickey had come from the Carolinas to be there with us. And I really thought that was special. So from a Villanova guy, right, as a family, and I'm here telling you, that his highest standard is from the families that he helped. Because without him, he gave us the strength to get to where we are. And I'm just proud to be here to talk about it. Thanks, Mickey. Thank you so much, Dr. Travis and Mr. Canuso. We do appreciate your generosity and time and spirit to join us this evening. And your tribute to Dr. Donaldson speaks volumes of your respect for him and the depths of his commitment to his profession, the children he served, and their families. So I invite you all to uh, partake of the beverages. There's food being butlered around. And uh, when dinner is ready, the wait staff will ask us to come over. So thank you so much for coming.